So the girl seated herself on the horse and rode for a long, long way. And at last she came to the mountain, where an aged woman was sitting outside with a gold cardin comb. The girl asked her if she knew the way to the castle, which lay east of the sun and west of the moon. But she said what the first old woman had said. I know nothing about it, but that it is east of the sun and west of the moon, and that you will be a long time getting to it, if ever you get there at all. But you shall have the loan of my horse to an old woman who lives the nearest to me. Perhaps she may know where the castle is. And when you have got to her, you may just strike the horse behind the left ear and bid it go home again. And then she gave her the gold carding comb, for it might perhaps be of use to her, she said. So the girl seated herself on the horse and rode a wearisome long way onward again. And after a very long time, she came to a great mountain where an aged woman was sitting, spinning at a golden spinning wheel. Of this woman too, she inquired if she knew the way to the prince and where to find the castle which lay east of the sun and west of the moon. But it was only the same thing once again. Maybe it was you who should have had the prince, said the old woman. Yes, indeed, I should have been the one, said the girl. But this old crone knew the way no better than the others. It was east of the sun and west of the moon, she knew that. And you will be a long time in getting to it, if ever you get to it all, she said. But you may have the loan of my horse, and I think you'd better ride to the east wind and ask him. Perhaps he may know where the castle is and will blow you thither. But when you have got to him, you must just strike the horse beneath the left ear and he will come home again. And then she gave her the golden spinning wheel saying, perhaps you may find that you have a use for it. The girl had to ride for a great many days and for a long and wearisome time before she got there. But at last she did arrive. And then she asked the east wind if he could tell her the way to the prince who dwelt east of the sun and west of the moon. Well, said the east wind, I have heard tell of the prince and of his castle, but I don't know the way to it, for I've never blown so far. But if you like, I will go with you to my brother, the west wind. He may know that, for he is much stronger than I am. You may sit on my back, and then I can carry you there. So she seated herself on his back, and they did go swiftly. When they got there, the east wind went in and said the girl with whom he had come was the one who ought to have had the prince at the castle, which lay east of the sun and west of the moon, and that now she was travelling about to find him again. So he had come here with her and would like to hear if the west wind knew whereabouts the castle was. No, said the west wind, so far as that have I never blown, but if you like I will go with you to the south wind. He's much stronger than either of us and has roamed far and wide. Perhaps he can tell you what you want to know. You may seat yourself on my back and I'll carry you to him. So she did this and journeyed to the south wind. Neither was she very long on the way. When they'd got there, the west wind asked him if he could tell her the way to the castle that lay east of the sun and west of the moon, for she was the girl who ought to marry the prince who lived there. Oh, indeed, said the south wind. Is that she? Well, said he, I have wandered about a great deal in my time and in all kinds of places, but I've never blown so far as that. If you like, however, I will go with you to my brother, the north wind. He is the oldest and the strongest of all of us. And if he does not know where it is, no one in the whole world will be able to tell you. You may sit on my back and I will carry you there. So she seated herself on his back and off he went from his house in great haste and they were not long on the way. When they came near the north wind's dwelling he was so wild and frantic that they felt cold gusts a long while before they got there. What do you want? he roared out from afar and they froze as they heard. Said the south wind, it is I and this is she who should have had the prince who lives in the castle, which lies east of the sun and west of the moon. And now she wishes to ask you if you have ever been there and can tell her the way, for she would gladly find him again. Yes, said the north wind, I know where it is. I once blew an aspen leaf there, 
but I was so tired that for many days afterwards I was not able to blow at all. However, if you're really anxious to go there and you're not afraid to go with me, I will take you on my back and try if I can blow you there. Get there I must, said she, and if there is any way of going, I will, and I have no fear no matter how fast you go. Very well, said the North Wind, but you must sleep here tonight, for if we are ever to get there, we must have the day before us. The North Wind woke her betimes next morning and puffed himself up and made himself so big and so strong that it was frightful to see him. And away they went high up through the air, as if they would not stop until they had reached the very end of the world. Down below there was such a storm. It blew down woods and houses, and when they were above the sea, the ships were wrecked by the hundreds. And thus they tore on and on, and a long time went by. And then yet more time passed, and still they were above the sea, and the north wind grew tired and more tired, and at last so utterly weary that he was scarcely able to blow any longer, and he sank and sank lower and lower, until at last he went so low that the waves dashed against the heels of the poor girl he was carrying. Art thou afraid? said the north wind. I have no fear, said she, and it was true. But they were not very, very far from land, and there was just enough strength left in the north wind to enable him to throw her onto the shore, immediately under the windows of a castle, which lay east of the sun and west of the moon. But then he was so weary and worn out that he was forced to rest for several days before he could go to his own home again. Next morning she sat down beneath the walls of the castle to play with the golden apple, and the first person she saw was the maiden with the long nose who was to have the prince. How much do you want for that gold apple of yours, girl? said she, opening the window. It can't be bought either for gold or money, answered the girl. If it cannot be bought for either gold or money, what will buy it? You may say what you please, said the princess. Well, if I may go to the prince who is here and be with him tonight, you shall have it, said the girl who had come with the north wind. You may do that, said the princess for she had made up her mind what she would do. So the princess got the golden apple, but when the girl went up to the prince's apartment that night, he was asleep, for the princess had so contrived it. The poor girl called to him and shook him, and between whiles she wept, but she could not wake him. In the morning, as soon as day dawned, in came the princess with the long nose and drove her out again. In the daytime she sat down once more beneath the windows of the castle and began to card with her golden carding comb. And then all happened as it had happened before. The princess asked her what she wanted for it, and she replied that it was not for sale, either for gold or money, but that if she could get leave to go to the prince and be with him during the night, she should have it. But when she went up to the prince's room, he was again asleep and let her call him or shake him or weep as she would, he still slept on, and she could not put any life in him. When daylight came in the morning, the princess with the long nose came too, and once more drove her away. And when day had quite come, the girl seated herself under the castle windows to spin with her golden spinning wheel, and the princess with the long nose wanted to have that also. So she opened the window and asked what she would take for it. The girl said what she had said on each of the former occasions, that it was not for sale either for gold or for money, but if she could get leave to go to the prince who lived there and be with him during the night, she should have it. Yes, said the princess, I will gladly consent to that. But in that place there were some Christian folk who had been carried off, and they had been sitting in the chamber which was next to that of the prince, and had heard how her woman had been there, who had wept and called him on two nights running, and they told the prince of this. So that evening, when the princess came once more with her sleeping drink, he pretended to drink, but threw it away behind him, for he suspected that it was a sleeping drink. So when the girl went into the prince's room this time, he was awake, and she had to tell him how she had come there. 
You have come just in time, said the prince, for I should have been married tomorrow, but I will not have the long-nosed princess, and you alone can save me. I will say that I want to see what my bride can do, and bid her wash the shirt which has three drops of tallow on it. This she will consent to do, for she does not know that this is you who let them fall on it, and no one can wash them out but one born of Christian folk. It cannot be done by one of a pack of trolls. And then I will say that no one shall ever be my bride but the woman who can do this, and I know that you can. There was great joy and gladness between them all that night. But the next day, when the wedding was to take place, the prince said, I must see what my bride can do. That you may do, said the stepmother. I have a fine shirt which I want to wear as my wedding shirt, but three drops of tallow have got upon it, and I want it to be washed off, and I have vowed to marry no one but the woman who is able to do it. If she cannot do that, she is not worth having. Well, that was a very small matter, they thought, and they agreed to do it. The princess with the long nose began to wash as well as she could, but the more she washed, and rubbed, the larger the spots grew. Ah, you can't wash at all, said the old troll hag, who was her mother. Give it to me. But she too had not had the shirt very long in her hands before it looked worse, and the more she washed it and rubbed it, the larger and blacker grew the spots. So the other trolls had to come and wash, but the more they did, the blacker and uglier grew the shirt, until at length it was as black as if it had been up the chimney. Oh, cried the prince, not one of you is good for anything at all. There is a beggar girl sitting outside the window, and I'll be bound that she can wash better than any of you. Come in, you girl there, he cried, and she came in. Can you wash this shirt clean? he cried. Oh, I don't know, she said, but I will try. And no sooner had she taken the shirt and dipped it in the water than it was white as driven snow, and even whiter than that. I will marry you, said the prince. Then the old troll hag flew into such a rage that she burst, and the princess with the long nose and all the little trolls must have burst too, for they've never been heard of since. The prince and his bride set free all the Christian folk who were imprisoned there and took away with them all the gold and all the silver that they could carry and moved far away from the castle, which lays east of the sun, and west of the moon 